On March 11, 2011, a magnitude 9.0 earthquake struck off the coast of northeastern Japan. Within minutes, tsunami waves as high as 40 meters crashed into the coastline. Over 19,000 people died, with more than 2,500 still missing. And entire towns were swept away, and the Fukushima nuclear disaster began. The disaster forced Japan to confront a question that had haunted the country for centuries. How do you protect a densely populated coastline from the ocean itself? The answer came in the form of one of the largest coastal defense projects ever attempted. Across hundreds of kilometers of shoreline, Japan began constructing a network of massive seawalls, floodgates, and barriers designed to withstand the next great tsunami. The scale of this system is staggering, and the engineering behind it required rethinking how coastal defenses are built. Japan sits along the Pacific Ring of Fire, where several tectonic plates meet and create frequent seismic activity. The country experiences thousands of earthquakes each year, and many of these occur underwater, along subduction zones, where one plate slides beneath another. When these underwater earthquakes are strong enough, they displace enormous volumes of water, creating tsunami waves that can travel at speeds of up to 800 kilometers per hour across the open ocean. The 2011 tsunami was in Japan's first encounter with such devastation. Historical records document major tsunamis going back centuries. In 1896, the Meiji Senriku tsunami killed over 22,000 people. In 1933, another Senriku tsunami claimed more than 3,000 lives. After each disaster, coastal communities rebuilt, often constructing seawalls that seemed adequate at the time. Before 2011, many towns in the Tohoku region already had seawalls, ranging from 4 to 10 meters in height. The 2011 tsunami overtopped nearly all of them. Japan's coastline stretches over 29,000 kilometers, and much of it is vulnerable. Approximately 50 million people live in coastal areas that could be affected by tsunami waves. Major cities like Tokyo, Osaka, and Nagoya are all at risk. The economic impact of losing these areas would be catastrophic, not just for Japan, but for global supply chains that depend on Japanese manufacturing and technology. After 2011, the Japanese government concluded that existing defenses were inadequate and committed to building a comprehensive tsunami defense system across the most vulnerable regions. The new seawall system required fundamentally different engineering than what existed before. Traditional seawalls were designed to deflect or absorb wave energy, but the 2011 tsunami proved that approach insufficient. Engineers had to design structures capable of withstanding sustained hydraulic forces from waves carrying debris, vehicles, and even buildings. The walls needed to remain standing even if water overtopped them. The design specifications varied by location, but the most robust sections were engineered to handle tsunami waves up to 14.7 meters high. This height wasn't arbitrary. It was calculated based on maximum credible tsunami scenarios for different coastal segments, using data from historical tsunamis and computer modeling of potential future earthquakes. Some sections were built to match this height. In Iwat Prefecture, certain seawalls reach heights of 14.7 to 15.5 meters above sea level. The walls themselves are massive concrete structures with reinforced foundations that extend deep into the bedrock. A typical cross-section shows a wall several meters thick at the base, tapering slightly toward the top. The foundations required extensive excavation and soil stabilization. In areas where bedrock was too deep, engineers drove steel piles up to 30 meters into the ground to anchor the structure. The concrete mix used in construction had to meet strict requirements for salt resistance and durability, since constant exposure to seawater accelerates degradation. One critical innovation involved the wall slope and shape. Rather than building purely vertical walls, many sections incorporate a curved face designed to redirect wave energy upward and back toward the ocean. This design reduces the hydraulic pressure on the wall itself. Engineers also added drainage systems to prevent water from pooling behind the walls, which could undermine the foundation or create additional pressure during an event. Construction of the seawall system began in earnest around 2012 and continued for over a decade. The project required moving massive amounts of earth and pouring tens of millions of cubic meters of concrete across approximately 400 kilometers of coastline. The scale was unprecedented for coastal defense construction. 
The construction process varied depending on location, but generally followed a similar sequence. First, crews excavated down to stable ground or bedrock. In coastal areas with soft sediment, this meant digging 10 to 15 meters deep. Then they installed the foundation, either by pouring concrete directly onto bedrock or by driving piles and building a supported foundation on top. Once the foundation was in place, they erected formwork and began pouring concrete in sections, allowing each section to cure before moving to the next. The logistics were immense. Remote coastal towns that had been devastated by the tsunami suddenly needed to accommodate construction crews numbering in the hundreds. Equipment had to be brought in by ship or over temporary roads. Concrete plants were established near construction sites to minimize transportation time, since concrete needs to be poured within hours of mixing. Some sites operated 24-hour construction schedules to meet deadlines. In areas where the seawall needed to connect with existing structures, like river mouths or harbors, the engineering became even more complex. These locations required floodgates that could be closed quickly. When tsunami warnings were issued, the gates themselves weigh hundreds of tons and require hydraulic systems capable of closing them against tidal currents. Backup power systems ensure the gates can be operated even if the electrical grid fails. One of the most famous sections of the new tsunami defense system is located in the town of Taro, in Iwate Prefecture. Taro had been protected by a double seawall system even before 2011, with an outer wall 10 meters high. The tsunami overtopped it and destroyed much of the town. The new wall at Taro stands 14.7 meters high and extends along the coast. It's one of the tallest sections in the entire system. The Taro seawall incorporates lessons learned from the 2011 disaster. The wall features a massive L-shaped cross-section with a deep foundation that extends 18 meters below ground level. The seaward face has a slight slope to deflect wave energy, and the top is wide enough to serve as an evacuation route if roads are blocked. During construction, workers discovered that soil conditions were worse than initial surveys indicated, requiring additional foundation work and delaying completion by nearly a year. Further south, in Miyagi Prefecture, the town of Kesanuma built a seawall system that incorporates multiple barriers. An outer seawall stands 9.9 .9 meters high along the harbor, while an inner series of walls and embankments provides backup protection. Between the two barriers is a buffer zone where parks and light commercial facilities are allowed, but residential buildings are prohibited. This layered defense approach recognizes that even the best walls might not stop every tsunami. The city of Kameishi in Iwate Prefecture took a different approach by focusing on offshore protection. The Kameishi Bay breakwater, which had been partially destroyed in 2011, was rebuilt and reinforced. This breakwater consists of two massive concrete and rock structures extending from opposite sides of the bay entrance, leaving only a narrow shipping channel between them. The breakwater is designed to reduce the energy of incoming tsunami waves before they reach the inner harbor. The structure was built in water depths reaching 63 meters and originally cost approximately $1.5 billion to construct. Each section of the breakwater is over 60 meters wide at the base and rises 6 meters above sea level. While the engineering accomplishments are remarkable, the project has been controversial from the start. Many coastal communities objected to the construction, arguing that the massive walls cut them off from the ocean that had sustained their fishing economies for generations. In towns where residents had always been able to see the water from their homes, the new walls blocked the view entirely. Some fishermen reported difficulty accessing the water and complained that the walls disrupted tidal patterns in ways that affected fish populations. The cost has been staggering. The Japanese government reportedly spent over 1.3 trillion yen, approximately 12 billion US dollars, on coastal defense projects in the decade following the 2011 tsunami. Critics argued this money could have been better spent on other protective measures, like improving evacuation routes and building more tsunami evacuation towers in at-risk areas. Some scientists pointed out that the walls only protect against tsunamis below a certain size. A truly catastrophic tsunami, like the one that struck in 2011, might still overtop the walls in some locations. Environmental concerns also emerged. The construction process disrupted coastal ecosystems, including beaches and tidal zones that served as habitat for fish and migratory birds. In some areas, sand movement patterns changed after the walls were built, 
leading to erosion problems in adjacent sections of coastline that weren't protected. Environmentalists documented cases where fish populations declined after seawalls blocked traditional spawning routes. Despite these objections, most coastal communities ultimately accepted the walls. For many residents who survived the 2011 tsunami, the trauma of that day outweighed concerns about ocean views or environmental impact. While opinion has been divided, many residents supported the seawall construction in tsunami-affected areas, even if they had reservations about specific aspects of the project. The seawall system is designed to work in conjunction with other protective measures. Japan has one of the most sophisticated tsunami warning systems in the world. A network of seismic sensors and ocean buoys can detect earthquakes and water displacement within seconds. When sensors detect conditions that could generate a tsunami, automated warnings are broadcast on television, radio, and mobile phones. Air raid sirens sound in coastal communities, and pre-recorded announcements instruct residents to evacuate to high ground immediately. The seawalls buy time. Even if they're eventually overtopped, the walls slow the initial surge and reduce the wave height of water that makes it inland. Computer models suggest that in many locations, the walls could reduce tsunami inundation by 30 to 50 percent compared to having no barrier at all. That reduction could mean the difference between water reaching the second floor of buildings versus only the first floor, or between flooding reaching residential areas versus stopping in industrial zones. Japan conducts regular tsunami evacuation drills in coastal communities. In some towns, these drills happen multiple times per year. Residents practice evacuating to designated high ground or to purpose-built evacuation towers, tall concrete structures with open-air platforms at the top. The seawalls are part of a defense-in-depth strategy that assumes no single measure will be 100% effective. The walls require ongoing maintenance. Concrete exposed to seawater degrades over time, and Japan's coastal environment is particularly harsh, with frequent typhoons and winter storms battering the structures. Inspection teams survey the walls regularly, looking for cracks, erosion, or signs of foundation settlement. Minor repairs can cost millions of yen per kilometer. Over the expected 50 to 70 year lifespan of the structures, maintenance costs will rival the original construction budget. A decade after construction began, the seawall system is largely complete, the work continues on some sections. The walls have transformed the coastal landscape of northeastern Japan. In some towns, the barrier dominates the skyline, a stark concrete reminder of the 2011 disaster. Other communities have attempted to soften the visual impact by planting trees along the walls or creating viewing platforms where residents can still see the ocean. The walls haven't been tested by a major tsunami yet. Smaller waves from distant earthquakes have reached the coast since 2011, but none approach the size of the 2011 event. The uncertainty about how the system will perform under real conditions creates anxiety for some residents. Engineers express confidence based on modeling and smaller scale tests, but acknowledge that nature can be unpredictable. For Japan, the seawall system represents a massive bet that such defenses are possible and worthwhile. Other countries with tsunami risk have watched the project closely. Indonesia, Chile, and the Philippines have all consulted with Japanese engineers about similar projects. The technology and techniques developed for Japan's walls are now being exported. Whether these massive structures will prove sufficient when the next great earthquake strikes remains unknown. Japan's history suggests that such an event is not a question of if, but when. The country has committed enormous resources to ensuring that when that day comes, the tsunami will meet the strongest barrier humans can build. What do you think about building massive walls versus focusing on evacuation systems? And which approach would you trust more? Let us know in the comments and subscribe for more stories from Worldwide Arch.